As part of my doctorate, I was hired as a lab assistant working with pediatric treatment. We were working on a paper measuring the exposure effect of a potential contaminant. While my colleagues were working on the measured effects on adults and the elderly, my team would work with children. The potential disruption to develop in adolescence was deemed important enough to have a separate set of experiments and measurements. The study garnered unilateral attention and funding of not only one, but four different pharmaceutical companies, Hatchet Pharmaceuticals being the main contributor. I was hired pretty late in the process. I wasn't even sure what the contaminant was, as it was just designated as the contaminant. Apparently, it was something that resided just under the topsoil in a large residential area. To not taint our measurements, my colleagues and I were given minimum information about the symptoms to look for and what to expect. Instead, we were provided a set of experiments and willing participants. It was all fast and haphazard. Most of us started on a Monday, and Tuesday the following week was the day of our first experiment. Little time to prepare, get settled, or even understand. Still, this could be big. Big enough to launch a career. The experiment, described as Cognition and Ocular Development Assessment, CODA, was to be performed with full consent and supervision of the parental guardians. All children were between 6 to 10 years old, and none of them had any observed deformities or illnesses. We were given limited access to certain medical records to make sure our study didn't have the potential to cause any harm. Then again, I'd read the experiment checklist, and there was nothing that could damage anyone. If anything, I argued the results would be pretty much useless. As Tuesday came around, me and my two colleagues had prepared as best we could. The three of us would put one participant each through a series of tests. The coda was three tests over the total of three hours. The parents were to be asked for consent before and after each step in giving the ability to stop any test at any given time. The experiment overall was surprisingly simple. It was supposed to be a measurement of cognitive and emotional development, mostly tested through facial and spatial recognition. The day of the experiment, I first met Logan, an eight-year-old kid sporting a baseball cap and a brand new Pokemon t-shirt. His mum was a bit anxious, but from what I'd been told, she had been generously compensated. As I met them in the parking lot and led them inside, I promised her we'd go to the specifics. Don't worry, I said. We're mostly gonna look at pictures. Doesn't sound too bad, Anna. He shook his head, but I'm yet to see him smile. Maybe his mum's anxiety rubbed off on him. The testing room was somewhat small and made entirely out of concrete. There was a pair of opposite two-way mirrors on each side of the room. The walls were painted this sickly mint green colour, a colour so neutral it hurt to look at. The first test was all about emotional intelligence. In sets of six pictures each, I was to show Logan various expressions and ask him which mostly correlated to an emotion. If they answered objectively wrong, according to a chart, we were supposed to ask them to explain their choice. Simple enough. I'd done something similar before. But this is where I first realized that Logan wasn't some ordinary kid. As I laid out the first image set, I asked him to identify the happiest face. Clearly, it was card number three, and Logan answered as much without hesitation. In the second image set, he was asked which one was the saddest. Again, it was number three. He answered correctly again. In the third picture, the six pictures were a wild mix, some sad, some happy. One guy was sleeping in the corner. Which one is the angriest? I asked. There was a correct answer. Number four, a woman foring her brow and exposing her teeth. Yet Logan looked at the ball for a long time. Number six, he said finally, pointing at the sleeping men. How come? 
I asked, following protocol. It's complicated. They almost killed his mum. The kid seemed almost distant, staring at the picture. What the hell? He answered the rest of the questions flawlessly, but that answer stuck with me. Such a strange reaction. Not only did he answer wrong to an obvious question, but it was also such an odd explanation. Logan himself seemed to have trouble finding the right word for it. The second test was similar, but there were new cards. In set of three, Logan was supposed to explain each emotion presented by the people in the pictures. Happy, sad, angry, scared. It was similar to the first test, but much more detailed. For every image, there would be a description and a short explanation given by the participant. We pressed forward. First three cards, no problem. Happy, happy, sad. Easy explanations. Second set of cards, same result. Surprised, sad, sad. But when the third image set came along, I didn't know what to say. Three people, all completely neutral. Not a single emotion on their face. It looked almost computer-generated. Logan didn't skip a beat, though. She's scared, he said. She doesn't know why she's doing this. And, uh, what about this one? Oh, he's hungry. He just doesn't show it. Hungry? Is that an emotion? Yes, he's really hungry. Dangerous. And the third one. Wogan took a long, hard look. After a few seconds, he looked up at me. Almost what he forgot about the picture for a while. Okay, he, ah, uh, he's, I think he's obstin. Obstin? Yeah, obstin. Well, what do you mean? That's what he is. I don't know a better word for it. So why is he, uh, obstin? He saw something he shouldn't have. We continued with several more anus sets, and Logan gave mostly ordinary answers. But every now and then, he'd throw in something absurd sounding. Obstin was the first, but there was also Adder, Gulled, and Srit. The descriptions were outlandish, and frankly nonsensical. Adder, he stared too long into the light. Gulled, he didn't go swimming, but his feet are still wet. Srit, he fell between the cracks. By the time I was about to start the third experiment, I had a few moments alone with Logan's mom. Still anxious, she held her arms close to herself and didn't meet my eyes. We'll be done in a bit, I said. He's doing great. He's such an imaginative child, you know, she nodded. He makes up things all the time. You should see his drawings. Does he have any trouble at school? No, not really. No, she smiled. Well, mostly not. Some of the other kids can get a bit creeped out when he starts making things up. I checked the clock. It was time to start the final experiment. All kids have a quirk or two, a smile back. That's what makes them kids. The final experiment was about recognizing places rather than people. One by one, I was to show Logan pictures of various places. Ordinary places like soup markets, playgrounds and factories. They were pretty easy to recognize. First I'd show him the pictures, then I'd ask him to describe the scene. Logan didn't seem to mind. The pictures themselves were easy for Logan to recognize. One by one, he explained what he saw. Factories with lots of cars parked outside, empty playgrounds. But as we got to a park, he sort of stopped. His expression shifted. That's a graveyard, he said. I had to stop myself from correcting him. It was obviously not a graveyard. Can you describe it? I asked. I... I really don't want to. There's a lot of people there. What kind of people? I was going off script, but I was just too curious. 
Wogan leaned in to look closer at the picture. There's a lot of strange colours, he said. The people who used to be there are gone. I couldn't tell what he was seeing. The picture was empty. As we finished up, Ogan went to the bathroom. I got some time to talk to his mum on her own, and I brought out the picture of the park. Do you have any idea what he sees here? I asked. No, she said, shaking her head. Could be anything. It's just strange, I said. Usually kids make up stories about dragons, wazers, wizards, that kind of stuff. Not graveyards and parks. Are you calling my son strange? I lost my train of thought. As Logan came back, she grabbed him by the arm to leave. Before they did, I caught up to them. I had to try something. Logan, I said, just a minute. They stopped, and his mum gave me a tied lock. I was thinking of buying this house, I said, bringing up a photo of a place I'd been checking out a few times. What do you think? He just stared at me, as if he didn't understand. He took off his baseball cap and scratched his ear. Looks dirty, he said. Lord of Ra, right there in the... Come on, Logan. His mother tugged his arm, and he was always dragged down the hall. Turning back to me one last time, he yelled back. He locked up, and then he didn't. I didn't lie when I said I was thinking about buying that house. There was an open view in the next day, and I decided to drop by on my lunch break. There were about eight other people there, all couples. I kind of disappeared among them. Maybe I wasn't being considered as a serious buyer. The place was a bit too large for me after all. As the realtor ran off to speak to a pregnant couple, I stopped in the foyer. I had this strange feeling in the pit of my stomach. Bro, I whispered to myself, right here. Just saying it out loud almost made me feel it. It was something so specific, so unique. It wasn't an emotion, as much as it was an experience, a story. I could imagine myself lying on the floor, looking up at the wood-brown ceiling. I could feel my back grown stiff as if I'd been lying down for too long. I could feel my eyes grow thick, like blinking through mud. Every breath, a conscious effort, arms unresponsive, a prayer for my heart to keep beating. Then, nothing. Row, to lock up, and then to not. I had this strange understanding, like I'd seen something I wasn't supposed to. Didn't the kid have a word for that too? God, I felt sick. Everyone was gathered around the realtor in the living room. I don't know what gave me the courage to confront him, but I just blurted out. Did the previous owner die here? I asked. In the foyer? No, uh, no, they didn't, he answered. You have to tell us that they did, one of the couple said. Another couple agreed. Okay, yeah. I mean, no one has died here. That was just true. No one did. But yes, they were found unresponsive in the foyer. There were loud sighs. A couple immediately left. Another left shortly afterwards. There was a queue to talk to the realtor. And within ten minutes, I was the only one left. Grow or not, I got the place too cheap to care. This made me curious as to the words the kid had used to describe the various places and emotions. Over the following days, as I transcribed our findings, I started thinking about them a lot more. Staring into the light too long, to get wet feet without swimming. It was all just cryptic nonsense. But what I'd felt the first night in my new house, that was Ro. I could feel it. It was the right way to describe it. One night, as I stood in the bathroom, I thought about the word Adder. It was what Logan had used to describe staring into light for too long. It felt fitting, but 
I didn't know if I'd experienced it. I tried locking up into the bathroom light and just saying it out loud, but I didn't get the same feeling as when I'd said Ro in the foyer. This wasn't it. This wasn't Ada. I sort of gave up on it after a while, but as I was watching TV, the thought came creeping back to me. There was a new segment about a patient with severe brain damage, a woman who couldn't breathe on her own or speak. She was aware, in a sense, but completely imprisoned in her body. The segment focused on how her family was caring for her, but I just leaned in closer and looked at her. Add her, I whispered to myself. That's it. And it was. No question about it. She was Ada. I'm staring into the light too long. I could feel it, understand it. Over the next couple of days, I started chasing Gald. The word meant someone whose feet was wet, despite not swimming. It took me a while to get this one, but I finally found it in a newspaper article online. I felt gulled from reading about a man who had died from an overdose down at the beach. His body had apparently choked itself, causing him to sweat to death. As he was homeless and living close to the beach, he had been found by a couple of teenagers building a sandcastle. But that feeling of drowning on dry land next to the ocean, that was called. With the right word, I could feel it. I could empathize. In my mind, I could be there with him. But the final word I noted, Surit. That was a difficult one. Over several days, I looked all over the internet. I searched forums, read obscure articles ranging back to the 90s. But I just couldn't shoot blindly into the web and hope for the best. I had to find out more, get something substantial. That thought made me take a step back. What about the photos? The photos which are no gun in the first place. Who were the people in the photos? I checked the inventory list for the experiment. Most of the cards were just mentioned as a number and an emotion, but I noticed that some of the faces were repeated with the same actors. All the cards which Logan had gotten right were repeated at least once. But the weird ones? Those were unique faces. The lighting was different. They didn't show any peculiar emotions. They were just... strange people. A bit off. I took a few photos of my phone and tried to do an image search. I couldn't get a single hit. These pictures simply weren't available anywhere in line. The ordinary emotions displayed could be found on various stock image sites, not the strange ones that Logan pointed out. Finally, after a few hours and dozens of pages clicked through, I did find a picture that looked like one of the models, but in a completely different setting. And this was just weird. The picture I found online was from a social media profile. The profile, in turn, portrayed the user page of the very same homeless man that had drowned in his own sweat from an overdose. The same one I've read an article of. But the article was written just a few days prior, and the picture must have been taken at least weeks ago. Listen, I don't know if he can get this. What Logan did was to perfectly describe using one of his made-up words, was exactly what was still about to happen to that man. The man who gulled, who overdosed on the beach. I mauled the whole thing over in my head countless times. And finally, I just gave up. I had to talk to Logan again. I did the creepiest thing I've ever done. I tracked down the kid at his school. The following day, as he was about to get on the bus back home, I waved at him from across the parking lot. He was surprised to see me, and couldn't place me at first. Then I could see him recognize me, like something lit up in his mind. Hey, he called out, science man. Hey, Logan, 
I called back. How's it been? Good, he said. You're not here for more tests, are you? He stopped a few feet ahead of me. Actually, I'm just here to ask you about that language of yours. Those strange words you use. How do you come up with them? That's easy, he said. Once you start talking it, you kind of don't stop. After a while, you just feel them, you know. So, where did you learn it? I asked. Anywhere special? I think I always know, he shrugged. Like, it's weird. Like listening, but not to a sound, but like a color. It's sort of just there, inside. So, you can always see it? Because sometimes you said people in the pictures were just happy or sad, ordinary things. Well, sometimes those things are easier to see. You said I should answer fast, not, you know, accurately. So, you can see it now, I chuckled. Anywhere, here with me. Sure, he smiled. Just stand still for a bit. Logan looked at me for a while. As I met his eyes, I could feel something. There was that feeling again. Hobston. To see something I shouldn't have. Right there, in that kid's eyes. He knew something. Strangely enough, it wasn't him that broke the silence. It was me. After S, I said. I didn't know why I said it, but it took Logan by surprise. Ah, uh, the one who shouts until they listen, he said. That's what it means, right? I think that's me. I don't know, I said. I... I'm sorry, Logan. I don't know why I said that. Did you see it? He asked, almost excited. Do you see it now? I want to say that I didn't. I want to say that I saw nothing, but that'd be a lie. A million little words crept into my mind, and as I stared into that kid's eyes, I saw something I shouldn't have. Now it was all becoming clearer. The more words I knew, the better I understood. The word I looked for, Suryat, was a lot more complex than Logan had made it out to be with human words. It was contextual. The man had died in an earthquake. He fell between the cracks. No, he hadn't. He was going to. It was describing events destined to unfold. But it was also describing something that had happened. Was it both? Neither? I see it, I admitted. Right there, I could feel the parking lot falling away in insignificance. With a single spoken word, we could tell each other infinite things. These mundane expressions were just the tip of the iceberg, a dumbed-down shadow of what was truly being said. The words told us of things that were, things that could be, and things there currently was. And in that moment of silence, of understanding, I heard the vibrant colors so clearly I could almost see them. They were piercing into my mind, forcing themselves into my understanding, screaming to me that once you understand something, you can't unlearn it. I forgot to breathe, as to not accidentally say something I shouldn't. You weren't talking about the pictures I held up in the test. You were looking at me, I said with nothing but shallow breath. I'm obstinate. He didn't even look at the picture. He didn't have to answer. I know it was true. It was written into the word itself that my realization would come. Then, as possibilities came rushing towards me, I could feel an enormous weight come down on me. My mind couldn't take it. My body was shutting down as I fell to my knees, screaming until my neck felt raw. The world started to fade as my heartbeat swallowed my hearing. I have a hard time describing what happened next. When I closed my eyes, I'd seen millions of possibilities, mostly pain, suffering, and terror. My own thoughts and emotions multiplied like a torch in a hall of mirrors. I'd see myself waking up in my bed, only to get murdered by a thousand different weapons. 
I'd see myself drowning in my bathtub, breaking my neck, falling down the stairs. Death. So much death. And then, in the blink of an eye, I'd be in the back of an ambulance, feeling the residual effect of a defibrillator on my chest. As I blinked, the ambulance burst into flames. The driver crashed into a tree, someone carving their initials into my chest with a scalpel. None of it was real, but I couldn't tell any more. Different words, with nothing but a well-placed syllable. All the while, I was just spitting out seemingly random words. My eyes lost focus, and, as I lost grip of reality, my body shut itself down in self-defense. Thank God. This was back in January of 2019. Logan was born with this language already stored in the back of his mind. Some kind of residual effect from this contamination. But for people like you and me, we can't take it all at once. So, over the years, with intense therapy to back me up, I've settled on trying to learn one single word. I'm going to find out as much as I can about just what it means to be obstin, the word describing me. There was so much to that one word that you could fill a lifetime with it. In a way, maybe that was the point. A god language meant to fit all of our very beings into simple expressions, like compressing a folder into a zip file. But that's just the thing. To learn what it really means to be obstinate, to be my word. I can't really do anything else but to live and see what happens next. Nonetheless, I want to go back to where my mind wandered off to. Still, sometimes, I could feel something creeping back into my mind. Little tinkles, syllables and sounds, reminding me of all the knowledge I still have stored away somewhere in my inner madness. Little words with galactic proportions. It is easy to slip back into that mind, just inches away from the edge of what my physical brain can hold. I sometimes wonder what all your words are. I sometimes wonder what they mean. I all really, really try not to think about it.